Welcome to Geeks Worldwide presents Press and Key. I am, of course, your host, Michael Schluger, and this is episode 290, was it three that we're up to? 292. 292. 292. That's right. Uh, we have a fantastic show for you, lots of stuff to discuss. Uh, as, uh, but of course, let me introduce the crew. We have Josh Irwin. Howdy. Good to have you, my friend. Good to be here. Uh, and Connor Howard. How's it going? Good to be here again. That's right. Always a pleasure. I am, uh, which we'll call it. Jay is apparently stuck at work, and Chris is off doing Chris things. So I hope to <laughs> get him back on this show soon. Um, so, uh, you know, if you've been watching, we're, we've started to do some things a little different. So we're going to open up with one what the fuck story for you, and we are going to conclude with one what the fuck story for you. So uh, our first what the fuck story has to do with Assassin's Creed. Um, Assassin's Creed, obviously, is no stranger to anybody, I think, at this point. Everyone has heard of the uh, video game series, and obviously the movie came out super popular now. But it has a history of having some really weird uh, partnerships um, when the games launch. The one that still sticks out in my mind is they had the partnership with like Gillette, back when unity came out and if you bought like gillette shaving cream or some sort of razors you would get like stuff it would like give you like a little dlc bonus like a weapon or some other stuff in the game and i always thought that was super odd uh but ubisoft has outdone themselves this time uh they are releasing a limited edition when i say limited i mean was it 15 pairs 16 16 exclusive pairs of Assassin's Creed themed footwear or, or sneakers in this case. And my God, they are ugly. <laughs> I mean, they're pretty weird looking. They've got like that really high top sole. You know, it's like the sole takes up half the shoe almost. You see how it like curves around the underside, like looking at the pictures of it, it's like, that's way too much sole or way too much rubber or whatever. Uh, it, you can it's... never have too much soul, baby. <laughs> Maybe that's what they're trying to say. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like it's like made of this weird canvas material too. It looks like this really odd texture. It's definitely different. It, it, it's kind of like going for that high fashion look. <laughs> it seems to me. I mean, if this is high fashion, then pff, I don't know. The high I... fashion's weird shit. You never like the stuff that comes out of like runway shows. It's weird. If you if you look at their video, you'll see that these are like hand painted, and this is a partnership with uh, a supposedly a very famous uh, sneaker designer named Dominic Loman. I'm not familiar with this guy, but maybe some sneaker heads can uh, you know hit us up and let us know how famous this dude is or whatever. But to me, the shoes look really, really ugly, and this game is set, obviously, in Egypt, and I have no idea, like, what this has to do with Egypt. It looks like the guy tried painting some hieroglyphics on the sides of the sneakers, but, like, honestly, I, I think if you wore these anywhere, you would just be, like, laughed at, essentially. They should have just gone with, like, leather strap sandals or something. I think that's what they're trying to sort of allude to with some of the design elements on this thing. Like they're trying to make it look like, hey, this might be something that some Egyptians who are really ahead of their time might have worn. You know, <laughs> I, it's it's like that's what there's that's what they're trying to suggest with it. It just looks like it, it, I agree. It is pretty dumb looking, and it's just funny to think like, why shoes? Of all the things they wouldn't they, it be funny? Of wouldn't it be all funny the things if they go to like the abs, uh, they go to the Abstergo scene and like the, your guy on the Animus is wearing these sneakers. That'd be perfect. I think that would really bring a full circle. Like, I'd be surprised if they don't do that now. Bring it all together. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's so so weird. Like, I mean, I just I just imagine like a really nerdy guy like winning the contest, or I don't, it doesn't even have to be a nerdy guy. I just like some dude buy like wins the contest, wears these outside, and he's like, "No, guys, these are cool." Like. These are Assassin's Creed. They're so cool. Everyone just. <sighs> I my my philosophy is if it's cool to you, that's fine. But it's just such a weird thing to promote a game with. I, I Assassin's Creed. I think you're right though. Like you said earlier, like they've done some weird promotions. Like when I I bought um, I I pre-ordered something a long time ago through GameStop, and they gave me a pint glass 
uh, promoting Assassin's Creed Revelations, the third Ezio game. So like a pint glass that I just drink beer and stuff out of. Like I'm not. I mean, that's fine. I like having pint glasses, but why a pint glass? It just, none of it. It just never made any sense to me. Very, stuff like that. Very weird. Um, so if you are, for some godforsaken reason, uh, interested in these shoes and you, you want these shoes, you have to basically be paying attention to their social media accounts and they will announce the contest and how they win the shoes. But why? Why would you possibly want these? But yeah, in case you do, in case you do. Um, but moving on, let's let's talk about the real news, the regular news for the week. Um, we're going to start off by talking about some 16-bit stuff. Um, the first story has to do with something called the Super NT. Um, so if you're not familiar with this company, um, and the, the Super NT is the name of the, the, the product, not the uh, company. The name of the company is, I think, Analog. Um, I believe that's the name of the company. A couple of months ago, maybe even a year ago now, they came out with this NES um, console. Um, and I think they called that one, they just called that one the Analog NT, and this thing was $550. And basically what they were promising you was a perfect um, NES uh, recreation experience that upscaled to 1080p. And the way they did it, at the time was they had the actual NES uh, chipboards inside the console. That's how they were able to replicate the emulation perfectly because it was the original hardware. Um, this is now the SNES version of the same thing, except it is not using uh, the, um, the original hardware. It's using something called FPGA. It, called? it had like a weird name to it. FPGA. Yes. The F FPGA thing? Yes, or? yes. An Altera yeah. Cyclone V FPGA. I have no idea what this is, but apparently it's, it's, a, really it's, it's a particular kind of circuit board. Um, that, can, can you hear me at all? I, I can hear you. You're a little quiet, though. Oh, okay. I don't know what's up there. So FPGA is basically a type of chip that you can all of the, like a circuit board would have um and it lets you perfectly emulate is josh having trouble any kind of any kind of integrated chip yeah he no? he's josh you're just like a little bit uh choppy but i understood i understood what you said but you are a little choppy i didn't oh. hear him at all what do you say he basically said that it's a special kind of chip that can a special kind of circuit board or chip that can emulate things perfectly oh, okay yeah pretty neat Good, good technology for this thing to have, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Um, the, you know, it's going to cost you for the pleasure. Um, of course. Yeah, it's going to cost you $190. And that's not terrible. That's, that's a decent price for, it sounds like what they're packing into this thing and what it can do. I don't know. I mean, that's that's not as bad as what was the, the Super Air, uh, what was the new thing that just came out? Like the, uh, that... NES thing, I think it was like five hundred bucks. That, yeah, that, like that was that. The, the NES one was five hundred. Uh, yeah. That came out a couple of months ago, if not a year ago. Right. Uh, I, I honestly think they're both um, a ridiculous price. And yeah, uh, yeah. So this this one basically can be sort of hacked or modded to allow for other games to play on the on the hardware. Obviously, the other one couldn't do that because it was the literally the exact same hardware as uh, as the Nintendo console. Mm -hmm. They literally like just bought old and used Nintendos, ripped them open, took out the hardware, cleaned it, and put it into their, you know, into a new shell. Right. Uh, this is different, um, but even so, I mean, why would you get this uh, when you could just for eighty dollars, for example, pick up a SNES Classic? Resting as many, depending on right, right. You know. yeah. Maybe some yeah. people see the technology in it as the investment. They think there's potential here. Like maybe they think if they jailbreak it and make it compatible with all these other, you know, platforms and games, that 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 makes that makes it so they get their money's worth. Maybe that's their thinking. I'm not quite there either, but 
I'm more with you. It's like not still not worth it to me, but maybe that's what people are thinking. I don't know. Yeah, there there are people that are really into uh, streaming and video quality, and these apparently do it better than the NES Classic. Then you can get emulated, all of that stuff. So that's that. They're for high end. They're for people who are very concerned about high end video quality. Right, right. So I mean. Um... What I had read was, you know, and, and I use the quotation marks here, perfect emulation of everything, right? But in my experience, for the most part, uh, any anytime I used an emulator to play a game, I never really felt like something was off. Now, obviously, you know, I played way more games on ROMs than I actually had back in the day, so... Maybe something was off by half a second or something, but it was never off in such a way that the game became unplayable or something like that. Um, how do you how do you guys feel about that? How important is it to be perfect emulation versus really good? I personally can't really tell the difference between really good and perfect to begin with, so I, I don't have very high standards. I mean, it's it's nice to hear that this thing is capable of such you know crisp renderings, but I don't necessarily need that as a consumer. It's it's nice to know that it has the firepower to do that, but I'm, I'm like that's not a priority for me. Yeah, it's not it's not a priority for me either. I think it's neat. It's definitely a boutique product for those people that care about uh, video signal quality. But uh, for the average consumer, they might as well get a SNES Classic or something. Yeah, I I completely agree with you guys. Um, the only and and just sort of like echo a little bit of what Connor said, you know, if you framed it as a device that plays like twenty different, if it emulates perfectly twenty different systems or something like that, then yeah, I could see it. But um, I I for me, I just don't see the you know it doesn't it doesn't do anything for me. I can I can just emulate it on my computer without any kind of an issue so right um but you know if you're interested now is the time to go uh they will likely sell out they usually sell these in limited numbers um this one in particular um might there's certainly going to be more availability since this is a readily available circuit board uh, opposed to you know original hardware so you know be more plentiful but uh i'm not sure how many of these they're making hmm. these guys i think like to make things exclusive just to you know for the sake yeah, of now, exclusivity to sell you to, it, to to raise the price a little bit on you right yeah I, I mean their analog nt was like a machined aluminum case and all that stuff this one actually has a plastic case so it's a it's a lot easier to manufacture so there will probably be a lot more of them right and you can so you can pre-order them now for Low, low price of one eighty nine ninety nine. So, <laughs> enjoy, enjoy. Um, the next sixteen um, bit story we have for you, and the last one for today. Uh, this one's really interesting to me, actually. So, um, for those of you that had a uh, Sega Genesis back in the day, uh, a game came out for I believe it was both Sega Genesis and Sega Saturn. Um, although I think it got a little more prominence on Sega Saturn called Sonic 3D Blast. Did you guys ever play this one as a as a kid? I actually did it myself, but I I could never keep up with how many Sonic games there were. <laughs> I rented it when it came out. It was a terrible. Uh, it was not a good game. Uh, it's kind of, if I remember correctly, it's kind of a three quarter overhead perspective. Um, yes. On a kind of on a kind of a grid, you can kind of go up, down, left, and right. Correct. Um, but it did not. It never controlled very well, and it just it wasn't a good game. There was nothing fun about it. Well, I have some good news for you, Josh. The uh, original developer of Sonic 3D Blast uh, has come forward and basically said that uh, he is going to create like a semi-official. Um, patch as it were for the game that's going to fix it Hooray! That, that's right that's I'm right so excited it only 
21 years. It only took 21 <laughs> years for this thing to come out. Um, and I mean, for those that put up with the weight, I mean, he's adding better movement and handling. He's making the gameplay less frustrating. He's adding supersonic into the game because that way he was not there before um as well as a level editor so you can now make your own levels Woo! oh my god um and i think he's adding a, a couple of maybe one or two uh new enemies that were like in the original development but taken out at the end um the bad news is he's not doing this full time. He's doing this in his spare time. The guy's name is, in case you want to look him up, is John Burton. Um, he's a well-known developer. And uh, basically, in his spare time, he's like, yeah, I'm going to do this for funsies. Um, what, what do you guys think? Cool or a little bit late to the party? I mean, it's always nice to see someone really dedicating themselves to a passion project like this, especially one they were involved with from the beginning and they're kind of coming back and adding to it. I mean, that's really cool for like, I don't know how big the fan base of this particular game is, but however many of them, all two or three of them, I don't know however many, but it's really cool for them to have this update to an old game, you know, come out of the blue, out of nowhere. So that's pretty neat. I, I, I know that I personally feel like being a Sonic fan is kind of like being a Browns fan, a <laughs> Browns fan, because like you have to get used to so much disappointment and <laughs> let down. Like you know, they they got they got so many garbage games thrown at them over the years that if one is updated to be a more complete and fulfilling package, hey, that's that's great for them. So that's cool. I mean, I don't, I'm not a Sonic fan. I haven't really, I, I haven't played a Sonic game in years, but. It's neat, you know. Good, yeah. It's good Isn't news. that good news? I mean, the the uh, Sonic Mania has been getting really, really positive buzz and really, really positive reviews. So, um, I feel like Sonic is, you know, if if only a little bit, sort of gaining some new fans after years of disappointment upon disappointment. Uh huh. So, I mean, this is nice. Yeah. I'm I'm curious to see if this will start a trend, right? Because he's calling this the uh, director's cut, as it were, of the game, and I wonder if other people will come forward with like, yeah, this game was kind of shitty when it first came out, but um, I'm gonna fix it now. So that would be cool if that that becomes more common. I think because like there's remasters, but those are usually by the publishers wanting more money, right? And director's cuts would be more like the the creative people kind of coming back and you know, completing their vision, which would be cool. Yeah, how crazy would it be if they made, like, a good game now? I mean, you know, like, he's had 21 years of feedback, so um, can't <laughs> yeah. be that hard at this point. Oh, right. easy. Easy peasy. I, I would, I mean, I'm pretty sure he has a pretty good idea. They're like, oh, you made Sonic 3D Blast? It sucked. Here's why. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure he's had that happen to him like a few times. Oh at least. yeah. Oh yeah, once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> Four so, or five times. Yeah, a lot. That's kind of interesting. Um, let's see what we got next. Uh, ah yes, humble bundle. So this 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 made a few waves in the gaming world. Uh, just this past week, um, Humble Bundle announced that it was being purchased by IGN. Uh, so Humble Bundle, if you've been living under a rock, is basically a website that sells bundled video games and the majority of the profits go to charity. Um, although they do have the, you, you, you get to set how much money you want to pay. So the bundles are... There's a, certain games which are a dollar, and then if you pay more than a certain amount, you get additional games, and you get to decide how to split your payment um, via charities of your choice. And uh, Josh disconnected. And uh, whatchamacallit, I've used this site a lot. Have you mm -hmm. used this site a lot, Connor? Oh, yeah. Yeah, several times. I've gotten some really good bundles from it. It's, I mean, I've always really admired the business model of it. I mean, I don't even know if you could call it a business model because, you know, it's obviously a very charity focused thing, but I've always liked, you know, that mission of theirs. Uh, I think most recently, 
I, I did a, I did one recently, but one that I remember pretty well was when they had a bundle for Battleborn. You, you remember Battleborn? <laughs> yeah, no one I else does. <laughs> uh, it was like a fifteen dollar bundle to get everything, and I did it, and I, I, I got like Mafia Two out of it. I got the Darkness games out of it. I got Battleborn. I got a few other you know bits and pieces that were really nice to have. So it was like you know such a great value, you know you know that goes towards such a great cause. Uh, you know, side note: Battleborn was way more fun than I expected it to be. Uh, I think it's really underrated, personally. Is dead. Just doesn't thrown. Matter. I know. I know it's dead. I can't find a game to save my life anymore. But it doesn't exist. It's like when I was playing it, when there were still people on it, it was really fun. Just throwing that out there. If it makes it come back, great. But but no. Bottom line: Humble Bundle is pretty cool. Uh, but it, it's it's crazy that. It, it's crazy this is happening, but at the same time, it's not that crazy because these are two pretty big names in the industry: IGN and Humble Bundle. I mean, IGN has its hands in everything. They've, you know, they've been a reviewer for a long time. They've they've been involved with uh, Congregate, which is like an online flash game platform that was pretty popular a while back. I don't know if you remember Congregate, but like they've they've just done a lot of ventures, and this kind of makes sense for them. Hopefully, they just sort of keep what's good about the Hundle Bundle intact as they go forward. That's my that's my wish. Otherwise yeah. I don't really have a problem with it as long as, you know, it works out best, you know, for the better for both parties. Well so the so the interesting thing is obviously like how much they expanded, right? Because originally they it was set up by indies, you know, mm -hmm. by and for indies as it were. But it expanded so much. They started selling books, they started selling software. Um, they started selling mobile games. I've purchased some mobile games uh, from them as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then they opened up the, they have a monthly subscription thing where you can get like uh, some pretty good games for cheap if you subscribe. Like, uh, you That's know, right, it's, yeah. a, it's a subscription based thing. So you pay something like 60 bucks for three or four months and they just give you different games every month. They have okay. a store where you can support indies. And uh, my understanding is it's pretty favorable to developers. Like developers get a bigger piece of the pie in, in this particular store. Um, interesting. Yeah. So yeah. So it's it is very interesting that uh, that IGN bought them. Um, does it worry you? Do you feel like IG, IGN said like, and this is a direct quote? They said uh, the idea is just to feed them with resources they need to keep doing what they're doing. They want them to, quote, stick to the fundamentals in the short term. We don't want to disrupt anything we're doing right already because the shared vision and overlap of our customer of our customer bases, there's going to be a lot of opportunities. Um, but are, are you worried about this deal? Do you, you know, what what's what's your worst case scenario here? I guess one thing my mind goes to as a worst case scenario is that you know, when I think of IGN. I think they're pretty they're pretty tied to, not super closely, but they have connections to like the AAA gaming industry. They they are involved with the higher profile releases. You know, previewing and reviewing those. So I guess I'm a little worried that they might start bleeding over into the humble bundles indie space with what they do with like you know more high profile AAA releases. I'm I'm worried that. But I mean, there's you know, been a bunch of AAA. Uh, I I guess I'm yeah. I'm guess I'm worried about it going like into overdrive and really drowning out the uh, indie spotlight sort of feel of mm -hmm. Humble Bundle. Like I, I'm worried that will be put on the back shelf a little more than it already has. I I don't really have any reason to think that that is going what's going to happen, but that's what I'm a little worried about. Mm -hmm. uh, but. I think one other thing is just I'm curious, like what IGN gets out of it, like why why, why own Humble Bundle? What's the what's the uh, angle for them? What's the advantage for them? I mean, I know there's like tons of cross promotional potential there, like you know just the you know merging the brands and you know all that stuff. But I mean, it's not like going to be a cash cow for them necessarily if they keep the charity model. So. Why do it other than like as a PR move yeah. or just as a brand expansion move? I, I'm just like not really seeing that part. They, you know? they get to they get of acquiring the company the company makes. One more time, Josh. So they get to write off the expense 
chance of acquiring the company, and then they get to write on that the. Your connection is terrible. So sorry. Like really, really atrocious. Something about writing off the expenses of a company. Oh, okay. But I think. Yeah, much. maybe. Like a tax thing, I guess. I don't know. Maybe. I, I well, can't the, the thing to me is it kind of, in my opinion, creates a bit of a conflict of interest, obviously, if you're writing about games and also own a website that sells games. Um, yeah. That, yeah. That creates a bit of a conflict of interest there. That's been the case with Game Informer for as long as it's existed, though, basically, because I don't know if you're aware of this, but Game Informer is owned. The, game, the magazine, the, mag, the online print magazine of Game Informer, it's owned by GameStop or uh, GameStop Incorporated. So the yes. retail chain, yeah, the real t retail chain that's involved in selling these video games, you know, owns and publishes a magazine promoting said video games. So I don't know if that's just the nature of the beast that we're just going to have to get used to. But, you, I mean, you have a point. I definitely take that point where it's like it could get kind of shady with, hey, here's an indie game you should you know, you really should consider playing, which we also, you know, conveniently just just so happen to have a special on in the in the humble bundle or whatever. So there's that. Uh, it looks like Josh is saying he's going to drop out because his connection is, is shitty, which really sucks. Yeah, I, I've been there, Josh. Don't no no shame. <laughs> sorry, sorry to see you go, but it happens. It I mean it, it literally happened to me like two weeks ago, so I can't judge I, I yeah i've been there indeed all right we are back so sorry about that technical difficulty um it sucks to lose someone uh you know it sucks to lose a, a guest host he's not even a guest host I shouldn't say that. he's not a guest anymore it's it sucks <laughs> to lose a co-host uh, that it does but the show must go on so we are gonna continue to bang this out um the next story has to do with Activision, which, you know what? I honestly feel like Activision and EA are in like some secret competition to <laughs> like decide which company is more evil and like which company is more terrible. Yeah, it's or been a rivalry between the, <laughs> between those two for years and years. Like it just goes back and forth. Yeah. You know? Like EA is like, oh yeah, Activision, well, we're going to make a shitty Mass Effect game. <laughs> now Activision's like firing back like, oh yeah, EA, well, we're going to, uh, what you call it, copyright a matchmaking system that encourages microtransactions. Checkmate. Oh, man. They're all just, I mean, everyone's just trying to make money, dude. And, like, greed is such a motivator that it, yeah, it looks like evil from the outside. <laughs> It's 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 hard it's hard to watch though. It's like we're gonna make Origin. Yeah, well, we're gonna do yearly Call of Duty games. It's like it's, you're right. It's just like they're just uh, trying to one up each other. It feels like uh, it really. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't making the last part up. That's that's actually the story. Uh, Activision patented a matchmaking system that encourages players to buy microtransactions, like. I don't. I don't see how EA is going to top this one. This is a really evil, evil, horrendous thing to do. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, pretty bad. It's pretty bad. It's like I'm still trying to get caught up on like what exact, how exactly it works. Was it some? It was something to do with like matching low skill players with some or like throwing off the skill levels or something like that. So it works in a couple of different ways, which is what yeah. makes it so insidious. It doesn't work in a very, you know, in, in just one way. So mm -hmm. this was filed, by the way, uh, on October, it was granted October 17th. So it was granted yesterday. Um, and I think it was filed like two or three days prior to that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, 2015. Sorry. The oh. patent was filed in 2015, but it was granted um, yesterday. October 17th of 2017. That's why we're talking about it because they they got permission. Okay. So how does this thing work? Um, so I'm going to give you two examples, and this is directly from their patent filing. Um, for example, microtransaction engine 128 may identify a junior player to match with a marquee player 
based on the player profile of the junior player. In the particular example, the junior player may wish to become an expert sniper in the game. Microtransaction Agent 128 may match the junior player with the player that is a highly skilled sniper in the game. In this manner, the junior player may be encouraged to make game-related purchases such as a rifle or other items used by the highly skilled sniper. So translation is it might detect that you have an interest in sniping. It will then match you with a player that has like really elite sniper stuff. And then you'll be like, shit, I want that really cool, you know, Scopomatic 3000, but I don't want to grind for it. So here's $20 Activision to give me the Scopomatic 3000 right away. Wow, that is okay. evil. That's like Lex Luthor level. Yeah, evil. That, that's like, mad genius, devious. Like that's, that's so underhanded. I mean, it is. I almost, I almost have to admire the, 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 the scumminess of it. Like the, the skullduggery of it. <laughs> oh, that's crazy, man. Right. Um, there's. Uh, by the way, that that's one example. Another example, if the player purchased a particular weapon, the microtransaction engine may match the player in a gameplay session in which the particular weapon is highly effective. So now what the game is saying is, oh, you bought a shotgun? All right. Uh, Here's a level where shotguns are like the best weapon to have. So you get a positive feedback loop you know, where you bought the gun and it was super duper useful. So you're like, oh shit, I need to buy more guns. Dude. Again. That's that's insane, man. Super, super shitty thing to do. Yeah, like not only is that kind of capitalism run amok, like that's that's one angle of it. It's like, you know, selling you shit constantly. But the other angle is like, it's just kind of upheaving the entire structure of how online games are like, managed i thought normally when you try and join a game it kind of like just goes by you know your your location your connection type and all that stuff and like what what kind of mode you want to play and then what games are ongoing and it puts you where you know you want to go but it sounds like they want to just put it in a more direction like it's more tailored to what you own and what they want you to buy like that's a complete shift in how matchmaking works well there's still everything that you mentioned is still being analyzed. They're still looking at your latency uh, Uh and your, but now they're also putting in your weapon preference. Now they're taking a look at like all these other factors that they hope to use to influence you into spending more money. It just sounds like it really complicates it. You know, that's crazy. It's, it's super messed up. And I think from a developer standpoint, I mean, it, it messes with the balance of your game. Can you imagine uh, a game oh, yeah. of, of Destiny? Because obviously the system hasn't been implemented in any game yet, but I right. could absolutely see being implemented in a game like Destiny in the future. Yeah, especially talking about Activision, like you know the Battlefield games, the you know Call of Duty. Like it's, it sounds almost tailor made for games like that. So that's that's definitely where I could see it happening. That's you know really what, worrying. Yeah. You know what EA is thinking right now? <laughs> EA is thinking like, fuck, they beat us to the punch. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> We're gonna have to really pull out all the stops this time. Like, how are we gonna top this one? It's they're gonna have to like block your screen with a targeted advertisement <laughs> for in-game guns or some shit like that. EA is gonna have to really go all out. <laughs> EA is gonna EA is basically I think my dog needs to be walked. So. Oh yeah. Um, can you hold it? Can you hold <laughs> it for like another 10, 15 minutes for me, please? This is important, uh, buddy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Trying to get this done. Um, bless you. Um, sure. EA is gonna have to like, I don't know, create a game so insanely fun. Actually, they've got that game coming out. Um, oh, shit, was Anthem? Anthem. Yeah, that's true. I think I think what they're going to do with Anthem is it's going to be amazing. They're going to give it away for free, but then every every like twenty minutes you have to watch ten ads to continue. <laughs> like that. 
that's that's the answer i see for this. oh my god it's it's sad how much i can believe that like that's <laughs> it's sad how i can see that as possible <laughs> god I'm damn that's the YouTube model. It's it's yeah. free, but you know, watch or, an ad every now and then. They'll give, you, they'll give you a boost if you watch like five ads or answer a survey or something. I swear. That's how so many mobile it's mobile coming. games work already. Yeah. So it's it's coming. Um, matter it's coming. of time. Um so yeah, this is this is pretty terrible. Um I'm gonna try really hard personally to not support Activision, but it um it makes me think of something that Jay said the other week that I'm going to bring up in the next story because it, it has to do with more shittiness. Uh, because, you know, you could argue almost that EA has answered the call already of Activision uh, this week because they closed down Visceral Games. Uh, that's right. Visceral is gone. Um, now, you you know, that name might not mean anything to you, but you know their games. Um, mm -hmm. Have you ever played something called Dead Space? Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah that That's was right. visceral. All of them, yeah, all three Dead Space games are visceral. Didn't uh, they also did some like Lord of the Rings games? I'm thinking like the licensed ones on PS2 back in the, the day. Ones on PS2, the ones that were like action adventure games. Those were really good. Those were like some of the best licensed movie games I've ever played in my life. They were how great. If it was back in like the PlayStation 2 days cuz they would play the for the scene from the movie and then they would like seamlessly transition like, like shift into game yeah. graphics. At Hell the, yeah, dude. At the time was, it was like, whoa. That was crazy. boss. I loved those games. Yeah, yeah so that cool. that was visceral. That was them. So they are gone. Um and would you would you like to do us the honors and read the statement by EA as to why they were closed? I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like I need to. We should be playing like taps right now or something like that. <laughs> Where is it? All right, yes, yeah, shut, shuts down visceral. Um, I there's one statement from uh, what's his name, uh, Patrick Soderland said right. some, some something along the lines of, uh, well. Yeah, we're talking like specifically this this is framed around an unnamed Star Wars game that Visceral was working on, but Right. Uh they were so Visceral is working on a unannounced, unnamed Star Wars project that was apparently gonna be story driven, linear. Right, a story driven um, linear game a la yeah. Uncharted. Right? And so Soderland says regarding this game specifically and generally Visceral Studios quote it has become clear that to deliver an experience that players will want to come back to and enjoy for a long time to come we needed to pivot the design and whatever the hell that means uh he continues quote we are shifting the game to be a broader experience that allows for more variety and player agency would you uh, would you like me to translate that for you yes Connor? yes please yes please okay so what he's saying is we want your money <laughs> and we're going to stuff this thing so full of microtransactions <sighs> that you're going to have to pay. You're going to have to buy this game three times over to squeeze any fun out of it. It's, we're going to make, we're going to turn it. We're going to turn it into the destiny of star Wars. Exactly. Gonna, <laughs> that's, it hurts my soul to read that <laughs> and hear that. Um, but no, it's, it's, I've 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 noticed for a, for a while it's been kind of the reality for a while that uh per, like publishers uh you know and on the, on the business end of making games they they have almost a disdain for single player story driven games because they don't see dollar signs when they when they think of those games they think oh that's a one and done people are going to buy that once and be done with it unless you know it's like Shadow of War and you can fill it with loot boxes that's becoming norm but like well, that's they, that's the thing, right? And oh, I'll let you finish the thought. It's just like you know, I've heard, I've I've known that for a while, kind of back of my mind. I think a lot of people have, but to hear someone kind of come out and you know, they run it through a bullshit filter. But that's basically what they're saying. They're saying there's no money in it. That's so we're gonna make it multiplayer or some shit like that. I don't know. Well, I think I think what's happening is they're they're doing the math and they're saying, well. We could make a hundred million. I'm just I'm pulling this number out of my ass, by the way. Sure, right. For the record. But we could make, let's say, fifty million dollars 
on this game, or we could put in microtransactions and make $150 million. Hmm. What are we, what are we going to do? Isn't it? That's a tough call right there. <laughs> Hard yeah. decision. So the thing is, and I think this is going to be sort of a, a bit of a running debate in the gaming world for the next couple of weeks, but um, there are extraordinarily successful single-player games that have come out of late. Obviously, the biggest one I think that jumps to everyone's mind is Breath of the Wild. Single sure. player, story driven game. Yeah, there's Absolutely. a little bit of, there's a little bit of DLC for it, but for the most part, this is a one and done game. You don't none of the DLC is critical. Or, yeah, I mean the, the Witcher 3 was one of the most successful role playing games of the last couple of years. Uh, it, it has expansions, but it's a smash hit. You've got uh, the Uncharted games, stuff like that. Uncharted, Near Automata, mm -hmm. um, Horizon Zero Dawn again oh, yeah. it has, it has one expansion coming out, but these games mm -hmm. are massively successful. But on the flip side of it, right, you have a game like Grand Theft Auto V, which not only was it a massive, critically acclaimed success, but the microtransactions uh, in GTA Online single handedly led Take Two to have a positive year. Like, mm -hmm. we haven't released any new games, but they're making bank because of those microtransactions. They buttered their bread strictly on that game's microtransactions alone. And, like, GTA V is still selling for 60 bucks now. Like, it's still that relevant of a game. Well, I mean, I've seen it certainly dip for the Steam sales to be a little Yeah, occasionally, more. yeah, but, like, it's still, like, almost full price in most cases. It's, it's crazy. I'm pretty sure it's still near the top of the sales charts if you yeah. look at it. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing, though. There is a way to do it right, and there is a way to do it wrong. Oh, yeah. And it's so much easier to do it wrong than it is to do it right. It's more lucrative to do it wrong, for sure. So, and, and, that's, and that's my worry, you know, because GTA V was amazing, not because of the microtransactions. The single player was amazing and, and untouched and left alone. Um, mm -hmm. what, what happens in the online stuff doesn't really affect... The, the single player campaign at all true so i'm worried about it connor i feel like i feel like certainly uh single player games aren't going anywhere like god of war is going to be launching next year and it's going to be huge yeah. you know right. it's going to sell like gangbusters but um do you feel like we're seeing the beginning of the end i don't think it's quite that bad yet i i think we're seeing I hate to borrow Mr. Soderlund's words, but that's like the shifting realities of the market. We're seeing like that's where the money is right now. But I think enough creative people, I think enough developers are acknowledging that there's still there's definitely still a demand for these story driven single player experiences that we're still getting. Yeah, I'm gonna play I'm and, gonna play devil's advocate for a second because for every game that we listed as a huge success, there's there's games that haven't been as successful. Prey, Resident Evil 7, that's a pretty big title, didn't do so hot. Dishonored 2 so. yeah. didn't do so hot. And Deus Ex, which which personally hurts me because that's an amazing game. Everyone yeah. should play it. Yeah, Mankind and, Divided was solid. I liked it. It's amazing. Such a good yeah. game. Yeah. It didn't do well. It didn't commercially, critically it was, you know, like praised up and down, but commercially mm -hmm. it just didn't didn't resonate. For You're right. Reason. You're you're right. I take that, but at the same time, there have been so many just absolute blunderous multiplayer launches too. Like, I, there's so many uh, knockoff League of Legends, you know, oh sure, MOBAs that are coming out. There's so many, you know, under you know undersold mediocre first person shooter like the hero shooter genre blew the hell up after Overwatch. I mean, think about Lawbreakers. I mean, is anyone playing Lawbreakers right now? It's uh, just, no, just like I, that. Think, I think we showed a story we. Were and privately we share a story that like concurrent player dropped to like less than a hundred or something. I saw that. Yeah. So it's just like, there's people are losing money on all kinds of games. People are making money on all kinds of games. I think there needs to be a return to the understanding that you can make a good game, no matter what kind of game it is. It's just up to us, the players and the consumers to vote with our vote with our wallets really, and show the industry what we actually want. And they'll continue giving it to us. So it's like, Guys, if you want loot boxes to stop, don't fucking buy them. <laughs> like, don't don't buy them. Don't give them the money. And that brings me back to what Jay said last week. 
And I think we're going to have to leave the... Well, I'll, I'll give you a chance to rebuttal, but this is something Jay said the other week. He said the... Um, the the video game market doesn't give a shit about us like we hardcore gamers we serious gamers or whatever you want to whatever term you want to give us the the guys that are like playing everything that comes out they don't care about us because we'll we'll totally walk away and be like no we're not going to give you our money but as long as there's like 10 whales or 100 whales out there as long as a casual player you know throws them five ten dollars they they will keep doing this shit over and over and over again that's that's probably true. Uh, I, I it's just I don't. Yeah, I can't really think of anyone I personally know who spends a significant amount of money on DLC like that. But they do exist. They are out there. So there's way just, more of them than there are of us. Unfortunate, but yeah, that's probably the case. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that is all our regular stories uh, for the week, and I'd love to hear feedback from you guys about. Uh, you know your your take on this whole debate. Make sure you tweet at us at at Pack Podcast, um, and I think that leaves us with the last uh, what the fuck story mm -hmm. of the week. This one is pretty amazing. Um, if you live in Taiwan and you're a fan of Gran Turismo, boy, is there a deal for you? Uh, <laughs> you can get a PlayStation 4, uh, PlayStation 4 Pro, I should say, the VR headset, mm -hmm. Gran Turismo Sports, a million dollar credit in the game. I don't know how much or how low that is in the game currency. Yeah. A Sony Bravia 4K television, a racing wheel, a racing seat, and a brand new car with custom <laughs> GT decals. That's right, a brand new car, a Mazda MX-5. For wow. the low, low price of forty-six thousand three hundred dollars USD. Wow! Now that, now that is apparently not a really a good deal. Um, I read that wow. if you put all the things separately, you have enough money to get yourself like a second Bravia television. Really? I, that's surprising to me because, like, yes. listing those things off and then giving me that price as the bundle tag, it's like I, I, I immediately think to myself, that's, that's not bad. It's a good deal. I mean, I, I when I think right, yeah, when I think the words "new car," I think, oh, it's got to be at least forty grand, and then you know all that other shit you, you threw in there. It's like, sure, I get that, but like, you know, if you actually shop around and do the math, it's probably a ripoff. But that's what I, I was told. Yeah, that's 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 like uh, translated or you know exchange uh, forty on forty six thousand U.S. dollars from like over a million Taiwanese currency uh, in a Taiwanese currency I'm guessing right yeah it's like 1.3 almost 1.4 million dollars in Taiwanese currency right so that's uh like that's a fuck a lot of money but I, I yeah like I, I think like that's not too bad though like all that stuff I'm a uh, brand new Mazda MX-5 I mean that's <laughs> like what do you what would you pay for that in the states like you know I have no idea off the lot about cars I I honestly think 40 grand for a brand new Mazda MX-5 isn't that bad. Well, like, I'm really thinking about it. You move to Taiwan where it's cheaper than own cars. I don't know. I guess. Maybe that's a... That's that's pretty crazy. I, this, this, I think this, to me, kind of brings me back to our conversation just now about... I think Jay mentioned whales, like the people who, uh, you know, there's there's minnows, like the people who spend like five, ten bucks on a game here and there, like, you know, on DLC here and there. And the whales, I think that's a term for people who their entire life is this particular game and they spend every cent they have on adding on to it. If there's a whale who plays GTA, like Grand, I'm sorry, drink Gran Turismo as like, that's, that's their, they, 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 they don't have a job or they don't have a social life or whatever. Like this, I mean, this, these are the kinds of people that keep these things happening. Like that's, this Good is enough. the kind of, that's the kind of pe person this, this bundle is a you know marketed to i can't i can't imagine there's too many people that are gonna no there, there's enough though there's like a few there's a handful yes. and that's i guess that's enough i guess that's enough i assume so yeah that's um weird, though fortunately that is all the stories we have for you this week i need to go walk this dog before he uh gets even grumpier ruins <laughs> your security deposit that's right. that's right. exactly exactly yeah. Uh, until next time, I have been your host, Michael Schluger. 
And I've been Connor Howard. Thanks for tuning in. Push a lot of buttons for us. Uh, no, let me, let me <laughs> press some keys. Amy. <laughs> yes. Um, have a great week of gaming. Push a lot of keys for us. Make sure you tweet at us at Pack Podcast. Hit like, hit subscribe, and we will see you next time. This has been a production of the GWW Radio Network. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Also, check out Geeks Worldwide at the GWW.com for all the latest news, reviews, and opinions on video games, comics, movies, TV, cosplay, and more. Geeks, assemble!